All right, I'm going to get everything started. Uh, my name is Adam DeGroat. I'm pastor of Pinnacle Lutheran Church. Uh, it's good to have you all here with us this evening. I'm going to be talking about the healing of private confession and absolution. So I just want to—I want to just get maybe a pulse from, uh, from you guys about what you may be thinking about private confession and absolution. When I say private confession, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Confess all your sins. Okay, who typically con- who who typically engages in in confession and absolution? Catholics. Ooh, those Catholics. Watch out for them. What else comes to your mind when you think of confession and absolution? What's that? A little closet that they go into? <laughs> no, <laughs> never mind. I'm not touching that one for. It. So it's called the confession, the confessional booth. What else? One last thing, maybe. Is it a requirement? I mean, when you think of confession and absolution, is it something that is absolutely required of you? Or is it a gift? Who gives it? What happens in confession and absolution? What do we focus most of our attention on? Do we emphasize the confession? Do we emphasize the absolution? And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight in the presentation. And I'm going to... I think it was nice that Cantor Resch was able to go to the extent that he was because, like I said, it, it lessens the amount of time that I actually have to teach. Because you guys, you're used to seeing me. You're like, oh, okay, Pastor DeGroat for another half hour tonight. So I'll try my best to be done by about 7.30 and then we'll be able to have, let, let our unleash Cantor Resch upon our organ this evening. Uh, very much looking forward to the, uh, the service of comp. But, so we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Um, and just understand just exactly what's inherent in the gifts that are present for us in confession, but most specifically in absolution. And I provided a little bit, of, uh, a little handout for you, um, along with some scripture verses, uh, which basically is going to it'll save you from having to reach for those pew Bibles that you have in front of you, and we can just hopefully flow through the presentation uh, as quickly as we can. First and foremost, I want to look and emphasize the thing that's listed at the very top. The healing of private confession or the forgiveness of sins starts with Jesus, and I think most of you would agree, is maintained by Jesus. That is, in terms of our lives that we live as baptized Christians, as ones who are absolved of our sins, who receive forgiveness, He is the one that brings us to that confession. He is the one that forgives us of our sins. He is the one that is with us and takes care of us as we walk through the rest of our life as baptized children of God. And not only that, He is the one that completes it and He is the one in which it ends and whom it ends with. And I'll explain exactly what all of this means as we go through the presentation. But basically, I just want to go through a little bit of history. And a lot of this is going to be a review for most of you. I'm going to stop to see if you guys have any questions periodically as we go through the, uh, through the presentation. The forgiveness of sins. What is it? The forgiveness of sins, as it's spoken about in the Holy Scriptures, most specifically, there's one word that we attach to the forgiveness of sins. It's a Greek word pronounced luo. You see that written on the piece, on the piece of paper that's there. It's that little funny looking thing right here. Kind of looks like, uh, I don't know what it looks like there. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's the word which basically means and literally means to loose, unloosen, to unfasten, unbind, or unburden. And a lot of times we would think about this with regard to, you know, a horse or an animal or, or, or cattle that had been muzzled or had some sort of reins put upon them. And that was a, it's a typical word. So what ends up happening is that oftentimes you would loose that rein from that animal and they were freed from the bondages of being led by that particular thing. And in our world, as, as individuals, we look at it and, we, and we'll start to look at it here uh, about why it is that we need this. And I want to look at that actually right now. Why do we need or what do we need to be loosened from, unfastened from, unbound from, and unburdened from? And I want to look at the scriptural references most specifically Romans 3.23. Um, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Psalm 51. Behold, I was brought forth 
in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. We are burdened by an unshakable plague, the plague of sin. But what's interesting and what's, I think, most, what's most comforting about what happens is that these things, these burdens, are loosened from us when we receive the forgiveness of sin. These chains and these shackles, literally, not necessarily in a literal sense that they just drop from us and we can hear the clanging of them as they hit the ground. But they are literally taken away from us. Placed upon Christ. Put to death with Him on the cross. And we are forgiven of all, we are forgiven and are indeed a new creation. But we're going to talk a little bit more, talk, talk more and develop that more as we go. So we know and we know, we understand that there is a tremendous need to be unburdened from these sins. How often do we need it? Matthew addresses this particular subject in Matthew chapter 18. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Most literally, seventy times. In other words, as often as sin happens. As often as sin occurs. And what this reminds us of is that, yes, indeed, as we come to to receive the forgiveness of sins. These things are loosened from us, but one of the things about having a sinful nature is we often have the tendency to be able to say, if these were my sins, and Bruce were Jesus, I use this with you a lot, and Bruce comes and these are my sins, and Bruce takes them away from me. Take them away from me. I have the tendency, in knowing that Bruce has done these things, to take away my sins, to loosen me, to forgive me from these things. I have the tendency to say, I like them. I feel comfortable in doing these things. I know that was nice that you did that, but I was growing very comfortable with doing different things. So what we understand is that what, what ha- ends up happening is that we're constantly reminded that we live in a perpetual cycle as Christians where we are constantly caught in the cycle of sinning, repenting, and being forgiven. Repeat. Sinning, repenting, and forgive, being forgiven. And we are caught in that particular cycle. So what, what ends up happening here is we under we have to under we uh, we must be and one of the reasons that we had the idea I, the, the idea of this healing conference had come and I preached a sermon about this during Lent. A lot of times people will will will, will have this understanding they know who Jesus is and what it is that He's done for them, but they really have a hard time understanding where it is that He can be found, where it is that. He reveals Himself and where it is that He comes to us still in this day and age. And I used an analogy in that particular sermon for those individuals who might look at, might, you might throw that out there and say, well, I know God is out there somewhere waiting to do and to give me certain things. And I used the analogy of Knox. Say he was playing in the basement and my little boy stubbed his toe on the corner of the wall and he was overwhelmed with tears. Would it be good enough for my son to know, as I sat up in the second floor, to know that his daddy was somewhere near? And I think for most of you, you would answer, no. My son needed his daddy. So too we, as the children of God, so too as sinners who fall into sin on a daily basis, need to understand that here and now, today, even in 2012, that our loving Father still bestows the forgiveness of sins to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're going to take a, just a little journey of how that, continue, how that continues to happen. And Cantor Resch uh, spoke about this very, very well. We talk about the means of grace in the Lutheran Church very, very often. And when we say the means of grace, basically what we mean is to say, Christ comes to us in specific ways. Ways that He 
promises that he will come to us. Most specifically, it's baptism, the Lord's Supper, and the preaching and teaching of the Word. But what we're going to talk about tonight, and this is exactly what, uh, what the notes are saying here, I'll get to that in just a second. He comes to us through the words of absolution. So we see, uh, with regard to the going back to the notes here in terms of who gives forgiveness. Uh, why don't we just look at the, the, uh, the scripture lesson, lesson from Ephesians 1. In Him, that is in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to Him, things in heaven and things on earth. So what we're reminded of here, and I'm going to just uh, skip over that particular passage in Mark 2, and you can look at that as your leisure. God gives it. Namely, He gives it through His Son, Jesus Christ. But we are reminded that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is not a distant Lord. He is not somewhere far off. He is not strange. He is not unfamiliar with the sufferings that we have. But he is very present. Indeed, what we are reminded of is that we have a Lord who in every way suffered as we do, but did so without sin. He has bestowed his mercies upon us. And most specifically, we see that looking at uh, where Jesus gives His forgiveness. He gives it through His blood, as we saw in Ephesians 1. He also gives it through bread. We've been talking an awful lot about this in the Bread of Life discourses. We look at John 6.51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, and if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And that bread that I will give for the life of this world is my flesh. Also, we understand that God comes to us through water. Romans, Paul talks about this in Romans and explaining to us the great benefits that baptism gives to us. For you members of Pinnacle, this particular Sunday you're going to see a miracle happen right before you. A young girl named Natalie will have the kingdom of heaven open to her through the waters of holy baptism. Her sins will be washed clean from her and she will become a child of God. The miraculous happens right here for us. And not only that, we understand that the forgiveness and the, pre- and, the, and the great gifts of God come through His Word. So, I just, just any, any questions with regard to where we're at so far and uh, in terms of where, we, where we're headed? Understanding that the forgiveness of sins comes through means. And it comes through means that are delivered specifically by Christ Himself through these particular means. So, just looking at a little bit of the history of the uh, history of the forgiveness of sins in the Christian church. The Christian church from the book of Acts, most specifically Acts 2, 36 through 41, has been practicing confession and absolution. They have been in, in, and they have been practicing these uh, practicing these simple things and administering the Lord's Supper, bread and wine, body and blood, preaching and teaching, in order to actually bestow upon God's people Jesus to give Jesus to his people. And what I, I also, one of the things we remember is we recall David's confession in Psalm 51. God asks, he asks God to be merciful to him. We recall from Psalm 51, David had been caught in the sin of adultery. And he goes, to, he goes before and he makes confession of what his sin was. And he says, O Lord, forgive me for these things in which I have done. But one of the things that's very interesting about Psalm 51 is what David continues to say. David is not just happy with the forgiveness of sins that he receives from God that particular day, but he insists that God would continue to be merciful to him. Why? Why does God, or why does David ask God that he would be continually merciful to him? Is it because that is it because God's forgiveness was not actualized in David? Or is it because David hadn't fully amended his life yet? He knew he was going to sin again. The reality is that David asks this particular this to ask God to be merciful as a reminder to himself 
that he is ever sinful and that he is always in need of God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And so, what was started from the beginning has carried on until the present day. But it goes back to one of the things that we had talked about. But wait a second, Pastor. I thought that confession was just something that the Catholic Church did. Well, let me ask you this. Are all the things that the Roman Catholic Church do, or are all the things that the Roman Catholics do bad? No. They actually do some things very well. It is not a Roman Catholic thing. Confession and absolution is indeed truly Catholic. And there's a very important distinction that we, that we have to make here with regard to the differences between Roman Catholic and Catholic Church. Because all of you here, although you are members of Pinnacle Lutheran Church, do make up the holy Christian and Catholic Church. How many of that, how many of you, am I surprising by saying that? <laughs> None of you? Good. Because when I say that you are members of the Catholic Church, I say the capital C Catholic in terms of being the universal church of all the believers in Jesus Christ. So there you are. You came here and learned that you were Catholic. Not really. <laughs> but we understand that that, that is the universal church of Christ and, has been histo and, and that church has, has historically practiced two types of confession. One, which you all, in, you all do on, every, on the occasion of every divine service. It looks a lot like this. Please turn with me now to page 184 of our hymnal as we confess, we confess our sins and receive absolution. We're not actually going to do it today, but the point is, you are very familiar with this. This is the form and the function in which we start every particular divine service with. And just one of the things that Cantor Resch had said so articulately is that Christianity is all about forgiveness. As a matter of fact, that's the only thing that Christianity is about. Now you may be saying, well, I thought it was about Jesus. Yes, and through whom does the absolution of our sins come from? So we understand here, this is not a, looking back to it, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not just a Roman Catholic thing, it's a universal, it's a universal Christian thing. We practice corporate confession but one of the things that's, uh, that, is, that has over the history of, the, of, the, of the, the Christian church fallen out of favor is the practice of private confession. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a couple of minutes. Is there forgiveness of sins in the corporate confession? In other words, when you confess your sins on a Sunday morning, are you forgiven for those sins by virtue of the, the pastor speaking the words of absolution to you? Yes, you are. Actually, what is corporate confession, though, other than that continued general confession of those sins, which basically says, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you. Presently, I rightly deserve all of your, your, your punishment. We see that the disciples practiced this. James 15, 16, uh, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. And also we see, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And what's important to understand too is that this is a practice that just wasn't some sort of, it wasn't willy-nilly chosen just by some man in the, in the Christian church a long time ago. It was instituted by Christ in order that His children would continually be able to receive the forgiveness of sins. And you'll be able to see those biblical references right there. So let me ask you this. Why is confession done? Is it to burden you? Is it to plague your conscience? Is it done so that we may enumerate our sins? Why do we confess our sins? I'm a coffee drinker. I drink coffee for the effect. I confess my sins for the same. 
in order that I may be luos, loosened from my sins, to be freed from the bondage of sin. And it is no great or holy work on the part of the Christian, as Paul reminds us in Romans 7. But the law reveals our sin and shows us who we truly are, quorum Deo. It's a fancy Latin word which basically means before God. Who are we before God? The answer is we are sinful. Yet we are fully saved. This is the one thing that I think you know perplexes so many Christians that there is an amazing paradox that exists. We are at the same time sinner and saint. Fully redeemed, fully justified, fully forgiven, given the promises of heaven, yet we fall into sin on a daily basis without any thinking or any sort of intent on our own behalf. They exist at the same time. So we see one of the things, and it goes back to what we're reminded of, is the great, the great need for us to be forgiven of our sins. Now this is a practice that, I, as I had said, was common, in so many, was, was common in the Christian church. But as is the case, as Cantor Resch had mentioned, so often the gifts of God can be abused. And they're oftentimes abused by the very men that have been given to distribute them so freely. And what was ending up happening is that it was around, well, it's through many, many years in the Roman Catholic Church, what was happening is there were abuses that were coming up with regard to private confession and corporate confession. And there were things that were happening that shouldn't have been happening. In other words, the, 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 the Catholic priests were making, uh, were making, they were making uh, private confession mandatory. They were saying that if you do not come and do these things, then there is no way that you can be saved. Not only that, but they were setting numbers of times that you had to come to confession per year. They were, they were saying that you had to enumerate your sins. In other words, if you had kicked the dog on Monday, and you had drank all of somebody else's coffee on Tuesday, etc., so on, if you did not enumerate all of your sins or forgot to confess even one, <laughs> in the great words of Scooby-Doo, Rutlow, The Roman Catholics also said that penance was necessary. In other words, once you came in to, and confessed your sins to the pastor, you had to go out and to do certain amounts of work in order to recover or to make up for those bad things that you had done. And not only that, but there was one thing that was happening that should never happen. Payment for the forgiveness of sins. Payment for time off of people's time in purgatory. Never mind the fact that purgatory doesn't exist. But the Roman Catholic Church was actually making people pay for the forgiveness of their sins. So then, in a great, in a great matter of timing, and, 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 and I, by, I certainly I believe by the grace of God, a man by the name of Martin Luther, you may be familiar with him, came onto the scene, not necessarily riding on a white horse, but he said that all of these things that the Roman Catholics are doing are not right. There should be confidence and comfort in the forgiveness of sins. Not only that, but in going to private confession or in confessing your sins, you should not be burdened, but you should go to be able to receive the great gifts that are inherent there. So what ended up happening is during the Reformation, which we celebrate on the 31st of October every single year, Martin Luther looked to correct these abuses. And so what he did is he started and he wrote in his small catechism, that confession had two parts. And for those of you who don't know, there are excerpts, not the excerpts, the whole, uh, uh, the whole catechism is in our hymn book. Uh, on the pages, I believe, 310, let me just bear with you just for a second. Well, we'll just ballpark it and say it's somewhere in the 300s. Anyways, this hymnal is very comprehensive. So Martin Luther writes about confession. And he says that confession has two parts. First and foremost, that we confess our sins. And second of all, that we receive forgiveness from the pastor as from God Himself. Not doubting, but firmly believing that by His, by the words of absolution spoken, that our sins were indeed and are indeed forgiven before God. So we talked a little bit about corporate confession 
in private confession. And I just want to look at the at the the uh, the order of private confession uh, in Luther's small catechism. It's in the hymnal, page three twenty six. I found my note. Page three twenty six. So you'll see there reiterated exactly what I just said, is that confession exists of two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive absolution from the past, that is, forgiveness from the pastor as from God Himself. What sins should we confess? And it's beautiful as, as, Mar- as Martin Luther writes this out, and he, he basically lays it out there and ex- explains to us something that may be considered to be very, very, very hard to approach. Um... Let's see, and I just I do want to look at, and while we're in the hymnal right now, if we could also turn to page 292 of the hymnal. And this is one of the things that, as a pastor, I'm trying to, trying to not so much say, you know, trying to make sure that there are individuals within the church who understand that this particular service or this particular means of grace is available to them. By no means is it a requirement. It's one of the things that I want to look at here. Just you'll notice this particular part here in red. It's one of my favorite parts of this particular service. If you are not burdened with particular sins, do not trouble yourself or search for and invent other sins, thereby turning confession into a torture. Instead, mention one or two sins that you know and let that be enough. Now, one of the main purposes that we practice private confession and absolution is really for two main reasons. First and foremost, that we can hear our name attached to the forgiveness of sins. I myself have a father confessor. I speak to him once a month. And it's one of the things that I've been told as a pastor that if I don't practice that which I preach, then I'm the biggest hypocrite in the church. So I contact my father confessor once a month, mention to him in the same in the same order that what you're seeing here. So one of the things that what I one of the things that I mentioned is that it's good for us to be able to participate for me to be able to participate in this in order that I can hear my name attached to the forgiveness of sins, but not only that to understand that forgiveness of sins can come for even those sins which I myself believe that are unforgivable. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of times, most specifically, as I look over this, the, the period of my life where I looked at them and I thought, there is no way that I could possibly be forgiven for that sin. And the first time I sat in a, in a private confession with my father confessor, I found that exactly the opposite was true. So we're going to talk about it a little bit there. So just to, to emphasize here, I did feel a burden lifted. I certainly did. It was a physical sensation unlike anything I had ever felt before in my life. But I also want to tell you that there are times that uh, there have been times where I've gone to private confession and absolution where I have felt absolutely nothing. Was I forgiven on those days that I felt nothing? Yes. How do I know? Because God has promised. So what we're going to do now is just briefly uh, look, probably for about six minutes, look at a guy who really could answer the question about why it is that private confession and absolution isn't used in the Lutheran church anymore. Because it isn't a very common practice. There was a man who lived a while ago, let's see, the dates that he actually lived, January 13th, 1635 to February 5th, 1705, was a German Lutheran pastor by the name... Philip Jacob Spanger. Bad. Bad. He was a bad, bad man. I'm going to explain to you why. Spanger was a German Lutheran pastor who had come to be known as the father of pietism. And his negative effects and the false teachings that he had have rippled through the Christian church for over 307 years. What he started to see is he saw some things that were he thought were injustices happening within private confession and absolution. He thought that there were individuals that were coming into the confession and that they were just reciting 
these orders of confession and really didn't have any understanding what it was that they were saying. So he figured at that time that the pastors were distributing and handing out what he called cheap grace. He didn't believe that the word of God was efficacious. He didn't believe that the word and the power of absolution was inherent in the word of God. So what we started to see is Spainer started to emphasize psychology and feelings and emotions and claim that true Christianity is that which we can feel and know by our experiences and our feelings. And it started to affect other aspects. He saw the practice of private confession and absolution as an offering of cheap grace, as I had mentioned, to those who would confess their sins and who did not believe in the efficacy of the absolution. He believed too often that penitent sinners thoughtlessly uttered memorized confessions. And many times, people did not understand what they were doing. To Spain, or this was a problem, because too often people would leave the confessionals and fall right back into the sins that they had confessed. He thought that confession ought to utterly change an individual straighten them up, and make them fly right. Why do we confess our sins? Remember why I drink coffee? We confess our sins in order that we may receive absolution. That is, forgiveness of our sins. Because there is no guarantee. What ended up happening is that Schweiner really didn't add any certainty to confession and absolution at all. As a matter of fact, I think this is one of the most interesting things, and I'm just going to skip to this particular part here. What Spainer did is he started to list requirements that people had to fulfill in order for, the, in order for them to actually be able to receive absolution. What he did is, it, it, it really, he started with three criteria, and ultimately what he ended up with was 10 or 11 criteria. And if you didn't fit these criteria, then guess what Spainer said? You are not absolved when you came to confess your sin. The first four criteria that he had is he said, you must confess and believe that you are an enemy of sin from your heart. You must have an earnest intention to, am to amend your life. In other words, you must have an earnest intention to not continue to do these things which you were doing before. You must truly believe in Jesus Christ. And you must vow obedience to God's command. <laughs> What's Spainer emphasizing? Or rather, who is Spainer emphasizing? You. Remember what we talked about from the very beginning? Forgiveness begins with Jesus, is maintained by Jesus, ends with Jesus. Spainer emphasized an active contrition. In other words, he said, in order for you to receive forgiveness of sins, you must feel it so much in your heart. And if you don't, then it shows that you aren't really sorry. Whereas Martin Luther was a little bit more gracious, along with the Holy Scriptures and the Lutheran Confessions. Remember what confessing your sins is? And there's one little note that I had skipped over, so I just want to go back to it real quick. There's no need to follow me with it. But basically, confession of sins is us speaking back to God what God says about us. In other words, we know that we who we are in the face of God by virtue of the Ten Commandments, of which we have not kept. We are moved by God to confess. And then, in being and in confessing our sins, what it is that we receive most assuredly because God promises that He gives it is the forgiveness of those sins. The wonderful thing about this, and just I want to look at this in terms of the summary. While Spainer's influence was exceedingly practical, it made a lot of sense. In order to say, you had to feel these things and you had to try to make things better once you left the confession. It confounded those who would repent of their sins and placed the emphasis not on the truth and power of God's word, but rather emphasized the individual's zeal 
emotion, zest, to amend one's own life. And this shifted the confession of sins from the realm of Coram Deo, saying that we confess our sins both in corporate and in private confession, Coram Deo, before God. To Coram Hominibus. Hum, that's not right. Hominibus. Spainer said, that it was important that you confess it before your fellow men in order that through to, to show that your repentance was true to your other Christians, to other Christians. Spainer's influence. Uh, I, mean, here, I want to just go here real quickly to the, the questions. How can you measure true repentance? The Scriptures, and I think even Luther explains it very well, if somebody has come, and as a pastor, if somebody comes to me and says, forgive me for I have sinned, that is in showing enough that that person is indeed wanting that which confession gives them, namely the forgiveness of sin. Being contrite, feeling sorry for your sins, it's not a matter of showing or shedding tears or doing any of these other things. But it's an understanding. You know, I think about it this way. And I explained this to uh, somebody the other day. As a young man, I worked in a pizza restaurant. And I remember the first pizza I ever tried to make. <laughs> I wrecked it completely. And my boss came in and he said something to the effect of, What happened here? And my first reaction was, I don't know. It must have been somebody else who did something. My boss found out. I look at it in, in, in other instances where, you know, in other instances of my life, confession and absolution is not unlike when the boss comes to you and says, I know what it is that you have done. I could deny it all the live long day. I could try to hide from the reality that has happened. But it serves me much better to understand that I have been found out. God knows exactly who it is that, I, that Adam DeGroat is in my sin. And to confess that particular sin to the bosses that I've had, other bosses that I've had in my, to, in, in, within my life, I remember, it doesn't feel very good. It's pretty humiliating, actually. It's embarrassing sometimes. But in every instance, what it is that I've found, and I've been very blessed to have good bosses throughout my entire life, and I assure you that in the particular instances of the pastors within the Lutheran Church and Missouri Synod, at least the ones that are here this evening, <laughs> that I know, that there is no judgment, but there is only forgiveness. And I think about this too, is that, you know, if somebody were to come into me, and I, in, in making preparation for this, this presentation, I was reading quite a few other articles and there was a question that somebody had asked. He said, you know, do I really have to go to my pastor to forgive, to hear and to believe or forgiven of my sin? And as Dr. Uh, uh, as Dr. Masaki at the seminary would say, is wrong question. You get to go to your pastor. The man who God has called to this church to deal in, this, in the business of this particular thing. That's my job. I am in the business of the forgiveness of sin. And I think it's one of the things that's so beautiful about these particular, this particular week and what was so exciting to me is to understand that in presenting to individuals that forgiveness and grace and comfort and certainty in this world is not far off. It's not a matter of needing to go out and look for it in this world. But it's a matter of understanding is exactly what it is that you've heard already from Cantor Resch. He comes to us through his means. He comes to the forgiveness of sins and he bestows it freely upon us. Yes, even for those of us who don't deserve it. Of whom I am chief. I assure you. I think Paul said it best. But the point of it all, all of this is, is one of the things that I just really, I, I did want to emphasize the most is that, um, you know, it's, it's not a requirement. There's no requirements at all. 
but it's wanting to keep the to open those doors for the individuals within this church and for in, in other places to remind you that the forgiveness of sins is real. And it is bestowed freely upon all of those. All of them. Actively still to this day. So uh, I just want to see if anybody has any questions. I, I apologize for running up the time here a little bit. Um, one thing with with uh, my little presentation here, and I did want to just mention to you as well, um, I had spoken with, uh, well, I don't know if I actually did speak with you guys, if I did or not. Um, what one of the things that I wanted to just mention to all of you is that um, that the pastors, all the pastors that are here this evening, uh, I can't necessarily speak for uh, Pastor Sar, another guy who, another pastor who's joined us this evening, Pastor Sar in the back there. Um, but uh, I'm going to be here until about nine this evening, and if for some reason there's uh, the, the notion to do those particular things, by all means, my door is open. If not tonight, it always is. Mr. Snyder. Right, and one of the things too is, you know, and you would bring up a good point, is that yes, our confession is to God, but most imp- another thing that that also comes into play with that is the understanding that we are in and amongst a community of people who also is making that confession, who stands with us and says together exactly what it is that God has already said about us. Yes, I already know all these particular things, but what that does is it helps us as Christians to understand that. You know, it does the forgiveness of sins, is the forgiveness of sins only able to be spoken by the pastor to you? No. Who has the authority to forgive sins? Jesus does, but he gives that also to you. And this is the beautiful thing that we talk about. I talk about this often in premarital counseling. Uh, there's an entire lesson actually that I, that I talk to our young, our young couples about is to say, your life is going to be a continual confession and absolution fest. Probably more for you, the man, than for the woman. Where you understand that you're laying yourself bare and, 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 and making yourself available to receive those forgi- that forgiveness which comes to you spoken by another human being. I love it. And just one other thing that I want to mention, uh, Mark Capuano is our head elder, and I, I, I very much appreciate uh, his services here. But um, on a number of different occasions, um, Mr. Capuano is, has extended that very same forgiveness to me. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Sometimes it's mainly just stubbing my toes and saying things that I shouldn't be saying. But the thing about it is is that I understand that there is forgiveness that comes not from Mark Capuano, but from Jesus through Mark Capuano. From Jesus through Pastor DeGroat. Etc., etc., etc. So you're absolutely right. I mean, certainly... You know, it's not looking at it and necessarily saying all we need is this particular confession because all we need is Jesus. But an understanding that that confession lays bare exactly who it is and then God speaks back to us through those words that you are forgiven. Any other questions?